So hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our, our talk on NetConf usability. My name is Ryan Goulding. I work for uh, Brocade Communications. Hi, I'm Alex Yudutalouet, working for InnoSype Technology. Hi, this is Bala. I work with Ryan with Brocade, Techno Brocade Communications. Uh, yep, so for a little bit of background, I mean, I, I focus kind of upstream um, in Bolid focuses on um, internal apps and kind of really pulling it all together with our, our uh, current offering for equipment. And uh, I don't know if you want to go over a little bit about Yeah, that. I'm as well uh, working uh, a bit upstream fixing bugs here and there in NetConf, but also mostly involve uh, downstream. So we've been through some of the headaches that, um, uh, of trying to get you know NetConf to work end to end. And uh, we're hoping to be able to share a little bit with of this with you in this presentation and uh, just general NetConf usability. Right, so basically uh, we'll just go over uh, how it was before, how it is now, and uh, what you can do with NetConf in Open Daylight and how to debug it. Yeah, mostly from a usability aspect, not really from the internal implementation aspect. That's what this session is about. So I want to go ahead with the first slide. Go ahead. Okay, so the, um, um, the legacy way of connecting device, um, NetConf device to open daylight was to use uh, the, loop the loop back. So basically the loop back is um, the open daylight mounting itself as, an MD so as a NetConf uh, client to which you would be able to send a request to mount uh, NetConf devices. Um, but uh, that method, uh, since Beryllium, isn't recommended to be used uh, for some reason that we will come we will we'll come over those reasons. But the main one are um, it's not cluster aware, and the way to configure your NetConf device using that way is uh, <laughs> really hard and not really um, um, straight straightforward. Yeah. So now when we we mount, which is going to be explained a little bit further, we use uh, spawning via network topology. But before you're literally going in and editing an XML file to connect to something, it's you know very, it's not nice, it's not usable. And uh, if you guys have used it or used Beryllium or some of the older versions, you'll remember maybe seeing this in RESTConf when you pull your, your operational uh, topology or inventory, you'll see um, the controller config is what the ID was on it. So if, you, if you've interacted with Open Daylight from a management perspective before, you've probably interacted with this loopback mechanism. So other thing is it, uh, other disadvantage to that is whatever device you add using the loopback mechanism where the config subsystem itself is mounted as a loopback. So all your modules or all your devices that you mounted using this method will end up in a current controller.xml file. So if there is any schema changes, etc., cetera, in, in a future version, <clears throat> it's extremely difficult to upgrade because everything is in that XML file. Uh, and this mechanism has two main drawbacks. One, like uh, Alexis said, it's not cluster aware. And it's extremely not amenable for upgrading, so. This is the same thing that if you were in Kevin's talk before on BGP, he was explaining why you should use the, the data store to store things. It's been a very common theme that, you know, a lot of the InnoSive folks have helped a ton with this. And op Open Daylight is that we want to get we want to get away from that. We want the configuration to be done through the data store and not the, the config subsystem. So the, so the network topology way is a new way to mount and connect to the uh, devices and it can devices. As you see, the, the way you interact with the controller, the APIs is extremely simplified in the new way. Uh, if you have done with the old way using the CSS, uh, config uh, system mount back loop back mechanism you you would have seen the the payload is extremely verbose and extremely difficult to use uh, the whole mechanism is simplified a lot in the new network topology way where you just had to really provide the the host name port number the username and password that's all that's those are all the only required elements that you had to give and you don't need to worry about what internally it has to do with uh, uh, what broker it uses, things like that. Those kind of, all these things are hidden in the new API. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the, the payload is going to be, basically, it's a put request you do to, to create the NetConf uh, to mount your device. And the payload doesn't has 
all those uh, um, namespace or URI you would have in the previous way of doing things. So it's um, straightforward. Um, and that, um, so those um, are some configuration you can have in your uh, netconf connector. Basically, the netconf connector is the entity in Open Daylight that uh, do the communication from your netconf device to the internal Open Daylight, and that's through which you are able to access your uh, netconf device. And so there are many ways to configure it uh, based on your needs. So uh, those uh, configuration elements are true regardless uh, the old or the new way of doing things. Um, um, I might, yeah, you, you can start with the first one. Oh, okay, so <laughs> some of the more advanced knobs that we've put in have, you know, unfortunately just been to make things work. Uh, you know, Open Daylight and Yang Tools has gotten a lot stricter, which in, in some cases, you know, it wasn't abiding by RFC 6020 before, and now it's enforcing things that it, it traditionally didn't. So when we moved to Beryllium originally, uh, you know, device just, just wouldn't connect anymore, and that's a very scary. <laughs> so we, we added one thing called the uh, schema cache directory, and uh, you know, if any of you have seen where the, the Yang files are actually loaded in the controller, this basically allows you to just make your own little separate cache for it. So say you have a device um, that just you know, does something a little bit out of the spec. We don't want to punish people. You know, we want them to be able to be successful and still use as much with that device as possible, even though it might not do something quite right. Or maybe maybe we don't <laughs> in open daylight. So we had the schema cache directory, which basically allows you to go in and modify all those Yang files as you see fit. So um, in our case, you know, we had a problem with revisionless imports and how they were actually resolving the uh, the target model. And you know, open daylight, we made the decision to have everything resolve to one version of the model. Um, we, we didn't do this. Our device writers, for some reason or another, assumed a different path. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, our device wasn't connecting. So we added this right here just to basically allow us to go in and tweak and specify the new version. Yeah. I just want to add one point to uh, what Ryan already added. Uh, he, he covered from the device side, from the ODL side, there is an issue with what we do with some of the standard IETF models. So what we, have, what we have done is, uh, for whatever internal reasons, we have modified the IETF files. For example, most importantly, IETF NetConf and IETF NetConf monitoring files to import a particular version of the dependencies, such as IETF Yang types or IETF INET types, so, which is not standard in IETF, uh, uh, standard Yang models. So, what it, so those models expect a specific version of the dependencies. But the devices that, sub, that implement NetCon, they rely on the standard models where they expect a revision-less import. And when they, in the capabilities, for example, they could, expo, they could advertise a later version of the dependent models. So what was happening was, because of the hard coding issue in the ODL side, uh, and coupled with uh, the second issue, once a model is there in a schema cache directory, it won't be downloaded unless there is a new version. So in, in our case, in the ODL case, we modified the young file, but we did not do anything with the version. We kept the version. So our cache directory was out of sync with what the device expected, and device did not mount, or even if it mounted, certain operations did not work. So this is a means of giving you a chance where a single device, if you want to have a clean place where you want to have only your young files of a particular device. So you can specify a directory where you don't have any clash with any of the young files with any of the other devices, including ODL's internal models. So if you specify this directory, this is completely clean and there is no clash, or even if there is some idiosyncrasies that is happening either on the device side and the ODL side, those can be avoided, and this is probably, this is your best friend, I should say. Yeah, and uh, just to point out, this will be solved, <laughs> hopefully with the binding spec v2, so we don't have to worry about it anymore, but this is just an inherent flaw in the current architecture. Yes? So with respect to this uh, parameter, is available? Yeah, so all those parameters and, and are- And beryllium, yeah. Are, um, beryllium, the, the two last one are not available in beryllium. 
But all of them are available in Boron, yes. And I'm just going to cover very quickly the other ones. Um, but basically, the reconnect on schema changed. Uh, if your netconf device support uh, IETF netconf monitoring, uh, I think you would have that netconf stream. And if you uh, enable that, basically each time you have your model is updated, it's going to update um, the, the, the netconf connector itself. So you would pick up the new uh, version. Um, the three different knob are coming afterwards. So the, the condition timeout, the default request timeout, and the max condition attempt. Uh, those are basically to let you uh, manage the way you want Open Daylight to connect to your NetConf device and how to fail it and when to fail it if uh, it doesn't mount. Um, um, between attempt, timeout, melee, so that's again the same thing, same goes with, oh, no, sorry, <laughs> I misread. Uh, there is one that is a default request. Uh, timeout, so basically when you're sending a request to your NetConf device, if in a given X second it hasn't replied to you, you can fail the request. Um, those are the, the configuration you can have. There is also this keep alive delay, so you can enable a keep alive so open daylight will uh, send requests. Yeah, I think it's just um, a blank edit config. Uh, and basically uh, the NetConf device w would respond okay. Uh, that way you're sure that the device is still uh, connecting, connected and communicating with Open Daylight in a fine way. Yeah, uh, and that one's important also because we found that, you know, some devices are really slow with getting back to you with the get config, so you can disable it by setting it to zero, but you'll, it'll appear as though like a device is flapping basically, and uh, in that case you probably just want to turn it off right now. The reason that it's put there is because SSH will eventually time out otherwise. Right. And so n the next one, the Yang model capabilities, um, I'm not going to explain that one in too, uh, uh, too deeply because basically if um, your NetConf device doesn't support NetConf, uh, IETF NetConf monitoring in, and ex exposing a capability but doesn't provide the model for it, you would have to sideload it. And you would use that configuration uh, knob to uh, specify what model you want to sideload. And there is a mechanism behind the scene. Uh, you would have to put that model under the cache schema directory of Open Daylight. Um, it's a bit technical. I hope people don't have to do that. <laughs> it's yeah, right, very, right. Very uh, uh, that. I'm not going to give you any more details about that one, but that's a possibility you can have if you're having trouble mounting your device. That might be something you want to try. And so the two others are new things that were added in uh, Boron. The Yang library let you specify an URL or an URI where um, you have a Yang library residing. So the NetConf connector would download all the Yang models um, that resides behind that URL. So it will um, be part of the, the, the schema context of the device. And finally, the last one is uh, the capability to send uh, concurrent RPC uh, to your NetConf device. So preview, um, prior to that, you were able to send only one request at a time to your NetConf device. Um, and now you can send multiple at the same time. So uh, I think we already covered uh, this slide. Uh, so basically, the. The advantages over the network topology or the loopback, uh, the bottom line is please do not use uh, the loopback method. It's kind of deprecated. It's not going to help in any which way uh, going forward. Uh, so please use the network topology way. It's uh, cluster aware. Uh, and the configuration data is persisted in the data store. So you don't need to worry about the configuration XML files anymore. Uh, it is, uh, like we also said, it's easy to upgrade. Using using the new method because nothing will go to the current uh, uh, con current context XML file. So everything is in the data store. So anything that needs upgradability, it's 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 much much easier. And Alexis also found out the new way uh, is a little bit more performant when connecting to the new devices. Yeah, if uh, there are question about that, you know, just come ask me and I'll explain why I think that. Yeah, and then. Uh, this we also have small postman collections of some essential netconf operations such as connecting disconnecting and some other configuration it's, it's mentioned in this so, 
Yeah, so now good question. What can I do with my NetConf connector? So <laughs> now that I have my NetConf device up and running and connected to my Open Daylight instance, uh, how am I going to interact with it? So that's the, 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 the question. I mean, that is not obvious to answer. Uh, but uh, one thing that is not mentioned here is if you go through API doc, so that's something that is provided by Open Daylight, you would see your uh, mount instance there and you would be able to, to see um, the capability it provides. Um, but anyway, if you don't want to go there, uh, you can, through this Yang X column mount um, keyword, if I can say, in the REST um, URL, the, um, as long as you have this keyword specified in your URL, that means that you're going to talk to a NetConf device. Um, to invoke an RPC, so yes, you have to do Yang X mount to access the, the device. Prior uh, to this Yang X mount, basically it's the NetConf, uh, the topology NetConf path and the node ID of your NetConf device. And then you will um, Yang X mount and to invoke the RPC, you would put the module name dash the, uh, the column, the operation name. So the operation name is basically the name of the RPCs Defined in your um, in your um, Yang model uh, of the model provided by your NetConf device. So uh, essentially, once the device is mounted, uh, whatever the capabilities of the devices is provided to the controller, uh, the including configuring the device either through their data store operations or if they are if they have exposed some specific RPCs. We could do that as well, and uh, in, uh, also getting the netconf notifications. Uh, uh, the netconf, so the configuration and getting the operational data is all supported through restconf, but the netconf notifications of the devices, it's not yet supported through rest. You cannot subscribe to that through restconf. Yet. Well, one last thing I want to add is basically when I say, uh, when we say here at the top, get data store. So when the NetConf device is mounted, you can access all the data it has in its own data store as a path in a path-through fashion, uh, and that's what this Yang X mount uh, uh, means. Basically, it's a, a path-through, so you're going to read directly in in your NetConf device. Sure. <laughs> Um, um, what, what do you mean? So for instance, with OBSDT, when I want to connect a, the OBSDT uh, plugin to a OBSDT device, I have to say the IP address, port number, and all that stuff. And there is a REST API call I would make to provide that information. So I feel like there should be something more generic which we could just use across all projects. They're divergent schemas, so, and most likely, I mean, in this case, NetConf is a completely different protocol, southbound protocol than OBSDB, so likely your device is going to run one or the other. It's not going to run both. No, no, I understand, but I mean, say, there could be a common model with documentation for each one. But to be fair to your point, I mean, code-wise, they're using the same uh, pipeline and the same way of setting the, the channel to communicate with the device. So code-wise, that's true. It's shared, and every project that needs to uh, create some uh, channels to communicate with uh, devices Exactly. Uh, from Open Daylight, there is somewhere uh, in Open Daylight where um, all those, um, you know, uh, connection are happening, and it's uh, abstract. So NetConf, OVSDB, OpenFlow, uh, uh, BGP, I believe, are all using that same uh, abstraction. Uh, but then, I mean, implementing uh, uh, when it comes to the implementation, yes, it's really tied to the protocol itself, and yeah, and also they also. Uh, restrict with their own semantics. For example, there are certain, for example, RFC for NetConf, uh, they restrict certain things, and they mandate certain things. So is with OVSDB. Uh, so it's very difficult to provide a common northbound interface uh, and still feel native for those users. So you, you might be able to. I mean, it, it is a cool use case, but I think that that is a that's an effort in itself. If you want to do it, please. <laughs> it's open source. Push patches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so now we're just doing a quick thing on clustering. Yeah, so if you want to do 
uh, clustering, you're going to want to use the ODL NetConf clustered topology. And what's important to kind of mention about this from a user standpoint is you don't want to do just ODL NetConf topology, and you don't want to do both of them. Really, this feature will, will work whether you're clustered or not, and that's the one that you probably want to use. Um, I don't. I think the only reason to have the other one is maybe performance. You're not using EOS, but. Uh, you can mount and configure devices on any of the nodes, so you don't have to particularly, you know, reach out to one node for one device, and all the resolutions handled automatically for you. Um, and as again, it's done through network topology, so it's exposed, you know, through REST on top of the controller. Um, like everything else, it's on, it's built off the raft, raft algorithm. We use clustering in the controller project, um, and you know, when the owner does go down, another node will be elected to take over. Yeah, so basically it it's works out of entity ownership like Ryan said. A particular controller in a cluster owns a uh, NetConf device and every, any, but you can make requests to any of the controllers in the, in the cluster, but the communication will happen from that owner controller to the device. And if that, that goes down through the entity ownership process, the election happens and the new controller will uh, take the ownership. There is one thing, I think we don't have it in the slide, but uh, we just definitely want to mention. There are two uh, features, ODL NetConf cluster topology and ODL NetConf topology. So do not install both of them together. They get installed, but do not do that because they step on each other and that, that can produce very unpredictable behavior. Anyway, so now let's say, yeah, that's true, but uh, <laughs> you better be careful about the feature How you're installing. How long do we have for this? I think that we're probably already over. So, so now the time is over, but uh, basically help me help you uh, would help us, the community, help you when you have an issue. Uh, we have a really nice uh, diagram, thanks to Ryan. Basically, it's the process you can have if you're hitting an issue, start there, <laughs> and, and, and you should have a process to, to, to fix your issue. Uh, we're just going to take a few questions. On the southbound, yeah, one, one of the nodes is connected. One of the controller is connected to the device. But it is hidden from the, it, it, it isn't hidden from, you don't need to worry about which one is connected. You can, you, if you want to configure the device, you can issue the request to any of the controllers, and then it just gets routed properly. Sorry, can you, can you say that? So one connection goes down, the entity manage manager will make sure it's automatically connected to the next. But it's not an active passive connection, there is only one connection at a time. There is no active passive, but if that goes down, the entity owner will make sure that gets connected to the different controller automatically. Yeah, it's, it's, you can't configure it that way right now. It, it might be something you could change though. <laughs> yeah, so there is uh, another effort uh, going on that singleton clustered service to make it even more seamless. Thank you, everyone. And Thank uh, you. <laughs>